Hello, Hoovian. Welcome to the main channel. Welcome back to the new... Well, welcome back to the Blue Box Files that was originally Doc 2 Discussions. This is our first guest on the renamed version of the podcast. Basically, it's the same as, as, as Doc 2 Discussions, but I've just renamed them all. But this is the first one that's got a proper thumbnail with the Blue Box Files logo in it and other bits and bobs. So, I have a special guest. I, I, I don't do this lightly. I have a special guest. He's best known for... Let, let's see. Let's see if I can pronounce this correctly because I had it earlier, but I don't remember. It's, it's Dorian Maldivar. Probably mispronounced that, but we'll find out. It's the one and only Simon Fisher Becker. Hey, 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 hello everybody. Well, I don't know what time it is where you're watching now, uh, but it's ten thirty in the morning in the UK, and I'm wide awake and I'm looking forward to having my chat with Tom. And did I pronounce the name right? Well, I pronounce it Moldavar, and the, as in Moldavarian. But you know, it's like it's like my own surname. People very uh, pronounce it in various different ways. Um, but uh, it all depends how they perceive it. But at the end of the day, they all know who you're talking about. Mm. Yes, and we'll find out more about the, his character, which I won't try and butcher again uh, a little bit later on. But let's 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 first get to, get to the origins. Before you were in Doctor Who, did you watch Doctor? Didn't you? Did you, were you a fan? Were you a big fan? Yes. Um, as you can see from my balding paint and my silver hair, I'm very old. And um, I was two when Doctor Who first started. So I was born in 1961, Doctor Who, of course, 1963. And my birthday is the 25th of November. So just um, uh, just to let people know. Uh, and I pretty a bit, I can't remember the first episode. I've seen it since, of course. Uh, but uh, I do remember William Hartnell. I must have been uh, about five-ish uh, when, when William Hartnell changed to Patrick Troughton. And so, yes, I've uh, followed Doctor Who uh, my entire life. There have been times I haven't been able to follow it as much as possible because I got older and work got in the way sometimes. And this is, and uh, I was a bit slow in getting tape recorders or video machines and VHS and Betamax. Now, those are phrases that you won't understand, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, some people my age who are watching will understand totally. But I was a bit slow in getting that equipment. So I only got to watch TV sort of live. Wow. Well, um, just to put you pink, just to surprise you here, but um, downstairs in my in my den, which isn't directly underneath me, I, I still have a VHS player because I have a workable TV. So I, I've got Lord of Doctor Who on VHS. I've got um, The Vicar of Dibley on VHS. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm probably the only person my age that knows most things. <laughs> I'm okay. That's, that's fair dues. My very first show reel was a, a VHS. Wow. Yeah. And, and so with, with you of having seen Doctor Who, with, how did you, like, get into it? Was, was Doctor Who the reason why you got into the acting industry, or, or was it, or was there anything else that, that got you into? Oh, uh, I don't know whether it it was the reason why I wanted to be an actor. And to be honest, it was a, it was a fantasy for many years, uh, but I was um, I was too timid to take the initial steps. Uh, I always uh, always fancied the idea, and of course, when I, uh, I in 1977 at my school. The music department, because I was more musical orientated rather than drama, um, announced after the summer holiday that uh, the music department and the drama department were going to get together to put on a production of Oliver. And I was just told I was going to be playing Mr. Bumble. No, would you like to? No audition. It's just being the big guy, <laughs> being the largest guy in that year. Uh, I just uh, and so uh, I um, I entered into the exercise with trepidation. But once I got into rehearsals, 
I found that some things I could do quite naturally and other things I had to work hard at doing. Uh, and of course, I then caught that's when I got the bug. And that's when I thought, oh, yes, maybe one day I would like to. Uh, but um, after school, um, did my degree, went to the civil service. Uh, then the civil service may be redundant. And then what do I do? And it was my grandfather who said, you know, if it's something you fancy doing, don't get to the age of 80 and say, I wish. Uh, so, uh, and that was it. So I used my redundancy money to do a postgraduate course. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, what they don't tell you is how to get work. They tell you what you need to do. And, and there may be one or two pointers, but there was no real, at the time, any proper advice of how you find work. So it was really just um, trial and error half the time. Uh, so that's how I got it. Uh, did I secretly want to be in Doctor Who? I must admit, uh, secretly, I wanted to play the master. <laughs> but I have to say, Dorian, in my view, is a much better character, is a much more... Um, rounded and uh, convoluted and multi-layered i mean the master is just downright nasty yeah. whereas dorium is a little more complicated than that yeah and, and and that and when when you were on about your grandfather giving you that advice that is really good advice you, you don't wish you don't want to have to wish you did something you, you just want to go ahead and do it and, and that and that's good advice in every situation. Well, you see, what it was, it was just it was just timing. Um, I had the money to do the postgraduate course because I was made redundant. Yeah. Uh, had I not had the money, that might have I might not have um, taken that route. But uh, I was uh, uh, so I I was lucky. I mean, so many other students uh, have to sort of do a job whilst they're studying. I was lucky that I had enough money uh, to um, to live off really and pay for the course. You know, thank you, Her Majesty's government, <laughs> for for giving me the opportunity. But there we go. So yes, and the course I did was very practical. So I came away feeling I had the skill set. Yeah. It was just the case of finding the work. And then and then when you how did you find out about this role? When did, did you have an agent at that time to find out about Dory? Oh well this is this is many years later, yes, in uh, the year two thousand. Um two thousand twenty there's uh, two thousand and ten, sorry. Um uh just before it was uh December two thousand and nine. I just got a phone call from my agent to say I've got you an audition for Doctor Who. And then they sent me through the script that they wanted me to learn, which effectively was the Pandorica scene that, uh, that I did with um, Doctor Song. Um, and that was it. And I was one of seven people that they saw. And then I became the chosen one. Yeah, and, and you were very good at it because because the, the character is like really well known and everyone loves it. And, and it, with with the costume how long because i know i know with doctor who right they, they they like to spend hours and hours and hours on end make putting people in these costumes how long did it take to get you into dorium well actually it was the makeup that was, that was the most length of time the costume was pretty straightforward it was um so i had a two hour period each day i was in in which they made me up and put me into my frock uh, and um, so for me, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, there were some others like a poor old Dan Starkey having to spend hours in the chair to have his makeup put on or to put, have his potato head put on, you know. So the idea of waking up knowing that you're going to be at least six hours in a chair, you know, because there's the time to take it off as well. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky with my makeup in that it was water-based and it could wash off quite easily. Uh, but it was good fun and I will admit when they started plastering the stuff on me and making me up and I looked in the mirror I could see that uh, Dorian was going to be a, an iconic character to look at yeah. uh, and um, but I didn't really seriously expect the response 
that uh, the fans gave me, which is brilliant. And thank you very much. And uh, Stephen Moffat uh, did tell me that he did want to do more with Dorian, but he wasn't too sure what. But when there was the fan interest, he sort of thought about it. And that's how where ultimately I end up with my head in a box. <laughs> and, and so did you have the comfortable costume? Because some of these costumes, are, the actors say that they run comfortable. Were you comfortable in your... I, I must admit I was. It, the, it was heavy. It was heavy and very warm. Uh, but I didn't complain because... As you say, some of the other costumes that these poor people have to wear, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. So I was, in that sense, very lucky. Yeah. And then, and then moving on to when you had your head in a box, how how did that, right? How did the costume work on that? Were you like sat on the floor and you and you just had your head in in a table? How did that sort of work? Yes. Uh, they filmed the plinth first. Mm. Then they took the plinth away and put a chair in place i sat on the chair uh, and then they put a big box over me covered in green i stuck my head out the top and then they put dorian's box on top of me that's how it all worked but on the chair i found so that i was at the right angle for the camera because they didn't want to move the camera i had to move in a position and i had to sort of I'm going to try and do it now i was in that sort of position so like a double helix yeah and uh, and after about 20 minutes that's quite uncomfortable so ironically though I, my costume was fine but my sitting position for the box was uh, less fine but you know it's um you know it's what you have to do yeah and since since your time on the tv version we'll get on to the other stuff you've done later on but uh, since you've been on the tv show have you kept in contact with the cast do you still talk to them yeah yeah some of the cast i'm facebook friends with and we sort of uh, we chat every now and then um uh, uh but uh, uh i don't do any social events with them uh, mainly because i now live in a completely different part of the country and now well, one thing that you are quite well known for within um, what, what's the best word for in the Doctor Who community within the fans? Is that you're 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 very up for joining in with the fan projects? Where, where where's your philosophy on that? How did where did you think? Oh, I'll join in. Well, it's all subject to time, really, and availability. And initially, I was just amazed I was asked. And I did say yes as often as I could. But also, a lot of these fan projects, not only are they just uh, sort of a hobby for some, but for others, it's uh, them practising a craft so that they can uh, then feel that they can go on study further and become a professional a cinematographer, writer, or whatever. And in that sense, I do like to get involved with things to, to help people um, build some sort of um, work experience, that's the phrase they use today, isn't it? And I clearly remember um, I've been very lucky. Nobody in my family was an actor. Uh, my aunt uh, was uh, went to the Royal College of Art and was a dress designer at one point. My grandmother was a painter. She painted watercolours and things. But as for being a performer, um, as far as I know, I'm the only one in my family. Where that's come from, I have no idea. So I went out the door, not really knowing which direction to go. But en route, I managed to work with, bump into... Uh, and and meet various people who were extremely helpful mm. and without their help I wouldn't be talking to you today and so I've always said if I was in a position where uh, people felt that I could help them I would where possible try. Um, and so one of the fan projects that recently got announced that you were it that you're working with or on depends on what capacity is at currently is the um, Doctor Who spoof um, charity event called Midday, and what what made you want to get involved in that? 
Uh, now, I'm going to admit, and I apologise to the producers of Big Day, I get involved with so many things, I'm not really well sure what I'm involved with at the time. Yeah. And I'm not really sure when somebody likes you ask me what's it's like. I mean, I think it's probably the case that they asked me. I liked the script. I liked the idea. Um, and, uh, uh, and in some cases, the projects uh, promote Dorium. So that's promoting me at the same time. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't get nothing out of these projects. What I find when they're when they're finally screened and aired, uh, other people either contact me to do other stuff, or they want to buy my book, my, or I should say one of my books, uh, or they want a photo and things. So I get something out of it. Yeah. And also, I know that people have said organizers of certain. Um, events have said, oh, we saw you in, or we saw, or we heard you in uh, on something or other, and we thought, oh yes, we must have Simon as a as a guest. So I'm not saying that's my main reason for doing it, but that is one of the spin-offs, you know. Uh, and at the end of the day, I'm practicing my craft. Yeah, and and um, with before we before we go on to the other other stuff you do, we'll. we'll We'll briefly mention this. Now, it who knows at this moment in time and whether or not you're allowed to say anything or or you want to. Are you by any chance involved in the centenary special of Doctor Who? Uh, if I am, I haven't been told yet. <laughs> How about the sixty? Are you? Involved in the I I I've had no contact. The only thing I have personally done is I've written to Russell T. Davis and other people and said, if you want to bring Dorian back, then I'd be more than happy to play Dorian again. That's that's all I've done. I've heard nothing, uh, as, as is with these things, because uh, uh, most things like to keep themselves top secret. Though I must say, Russell T. Davis has been doing a lot of publicity. Now, whether it'll actually appear in the final... Uh, final prints of anything is uh, interesting to note but uh, yes I've let it be known I'd be happy to continue uh, I can let you know that today which is what the 7th of July yeah. 7th of July 2022 I've had no phone call yeah. uh, there's an exclusive there um, and what's your thoughts on the current when I say current era I do mean the Jodie Whittaker era because technically it's still what's airing uh what what's your thoughts on the Geordie Whittaker era of Doctor Who well it was an interesting idea to go down the line of a, a gender change I think personally I think in a way it worked I felt uh Jodie came over as a bit of a school teacher a, a lot we were given a lecture which was a I thought unnecessary but I did love some of the stories the Rosa um story in particular stands out for me uh, because it goes back to the old tradition of Doctor Who. It tells you true history. I mean, that was the purpose of Doctor Who in the first place, was to teach history and science. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it was very good. Yeah. And and um, now we're going to look at the future. Um, if you got to cast the next Master, which actor would you want to see as the next Master? Well, again, we've had uh, uh, gender changes. So, uh, who would I? So, if I was going to go for a, a, a lady, we can either go for a younger lady or an older lady. If we went for an older lady, I would go for somebody like Francis de la Tour. Mm. Uh, if we were going to go, who would I choose? I tell you who, funny enough, I would think would be a very good. Um, uh, character uh, and could potentially be the doctor, I think is Floella Benjamin. Mm. I mean, a lot of people my age know her from a thing called Play School, but there's a, there's a I've seen her in other productions. There's a bit more to her yeah. than people know. I, I mean, she's become a politician now, but uh, if she fancied a foray uh, back before the cameras, I'd, I'd give her a go. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is a, a really weird thing to think someone went from play school to becoming a politician. I never... Well, that. you know, Jeremy Irons uh, was on play school in his day. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, 
you know, everybody, when they start out working, do any job that will give them some sort of publicity uh, and they enjoy it and get paid at the same time. Yeah. Um, just going off course for a sec, for any viewers uh, and listeners watching or listening to this, not knowing, not from, like, still in the UK, don't know what play school is, well, um, all you need to do is go on YouTube, search in play school, and you can watch it. But if you're in Australia... Well done, you understand what we're on about. Because Play School's still on in Australia. It's been going for 55 years. Right. Because the Australian viewers will understand, the UK viewers can watch YouTube. I'm not going to sit there and explain it. Uh, but it, it was a kids' programme that had lots of toys and uh, and spin-offs. Uh, there was uh, one of the famous, uh, as well as Flo Ella Benjamin, there was Brian Kant. And um, and then that came, they then had an extended show called, I think it was called Play Away which dealt more with maths and English. Uh, and that's where Johnny Ball, father of Zoe Ball, um, sort of came to the fore and excellent, excellent he was as well. And now with Doctor Who, you haven't just been in, we haven't just seen you in Doctor Who, we've also heard you in Doctor Who in Big Finish. Now, I re so I'm obviously not, I won't say late to the party. I would say not early enough to the spin-offs. I I mainly because I'm I'm not made of money, so I so I stick mainly with the normal ones. But yesterday I heard the first episode in the Jenny Two box set that you were in. First of all, how did that come about? And second of all, what was it like recording that? Well, <clears throat> as Dorian, uh, I've done, I think, now two uh, big finishes. There was one where, um, uh, I can't remember now, the Light Keepers or something, it was called. Companion uh, Chronicles. Yeah, um, it was in the 11th, the, the 11th Doctor Chronicles. And uh, so there's a. Um, how did Jenny come about? Well, I, again, it was Big Finish contacted me via my agent and said, We'd like to do this. Would you like to do it too? Studio. And there's a, a sort of big, uh, big, uh, we're all put into tiny little booths, but we can see each other. Although you've got the Perspex glass. So uh, and it's really good because when you're live with, and you can see how physically they're doing uh, their voice, uh, that helps you too. So, um, And I, I, I very much liked the, um, the, the story itself because it, it, it worked really well because obviously once you've seen the character on TV, you can just automatically visualise yes. what it looks like. And then it just, oh, it, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I don't know about any, anyone else watching this, but I really enjoyed it and thought it was phenomenal, if that's a, a good word to use. Yes. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And and would you do, if you got your own spin-off, would you do it? Of course. <laughs> of course. I, 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 and I'm freely, I, I, this I can tell you, uh, because it's something I did. Um so I can't be told off. I did sow the seed that Dorian wouldn't have used or wouldn't have sold or <laughs> in vertical was uh, sold uh, the vortex manipulator to Dr. Song, having not tried it. Yeah. So I did sow the seed that there could be the occasional episode where Dorian full bodied <laughs> could turn up uh, and he, he doesn't necessarily I mean, he's associated with Matt Smith's doctor, yeah. but uh, with the vortex manipulator, we don't actually know which doctor the that Dorian first met, and it could be Doctor Number Twenty Three, yeah. because Dorian knows a lot about the Doctor. Yeah. In in the in the episodes, you know, he he was a sort of storytelling teller, telling us what's going to happen in the future. And it was it was really it was really it was really nice to, to, to hear that you could just set, you could just tell that if some fan because it's been done before turns it into an animation, it would look as beautiful as it sounds. Yes. You, 
imagine you know and you can imagine the big fridge and the yeah getting trapped in a fridge you can just imagine that i don't know why yeah. anyone yeah. would imagine it. anyone in a fridge that's a bit they worry oh, but that's right you, you just need a little bit of imagination but uh, uh, the storylines of that help yeah and in with doctor who if would you because russell t davis wants to do a multiverse type marvel type thing um if you had to choose which character to do a tv spin-off with which character would you do a tv spin-off with like any character from the doctor universe that's obviously the actor's still alive if you had to like combine together to do a spin-off who would you do it with i'd quite like uh uh I, it's it's difficult because there are so many characters. I would love to do something with Joe Grant, Katie Manning, and Sophie Aldred uh, from the uh, classic Who. On the new side of things, you, uh, you got to have Dan Starkey and Neve McIntosh and Caitlin Stewart. We could be the Barmy Army, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Dan Dan Stark here as uh, as as Strax. I think is he yes, called? yeah, Strax. That's it. He's he's a very good actor, and it, and it, actually, when you when you see him in real life, when you see his face in real life, you, you can you never realize who he is. And he was in um, a program that was on CBC called Class Dismissed, and he was quite funny in that. So I think if you put him in any situation, he'll be a good fit. He was, he was also, uh, what was it called? Uh, I can't remember, it's a detective. Lady detective, is it Miss Scarlet? Yes. Miss Scarlet and the Duke or something, is it? Yeah, that, 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 is that is correct. Yes, uh, he was in the episode of that, uh, fantastic. I mean, whenever he's in prosthetics, of course, and you can't physically see his face, the giveaway is the gap in his front teeth. Wow, I never knew that. It was in the new series of Doctor Who as one of the from Tyrant. Yeah. It was a new design from Tyrant, so I yes. can't tell which one he was, but now I know if I ever rewatch it. Lovely chap, very funny. Yes. Very clever. Yeah, he, he is. Uh and and he's 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 very nice. And and so um in in a fictional world where where uh, any doctor can come back and have its own series. And and Dorian could be the companion. Which doctor would you like, like Dorian to be a companion to? Well, with time travel, you see, he could be the companion to them all. He could be an occasional companion, because uh, you know, he could be locked. I mean, with his head in a box, that box could be left anywhere, couldn't it? Yeah. But uh, but I think uh, that would limit it somewhat. But uh, <coughs> I'm making. I think uh, it would be interesting to see Dorum up against the master. Yes. Just because Dorum can be dark as well. So who could be the darkest of the two? But Dorum would be more loyal to the doctor. That's the difference. Whereas the master just, just, just wants to destroy the doctor, which is a, a bit of a, a you know, a, a two ply. Thing, really I think they should try if they bring the master back to have a bit more depth to him yeah yeah but that would be very interesting wouldn't it oh, and of course on a personal basis to work with uh, Alex Kingston as Dr Song uh, was was a delight uh, and uh, she did help calm me down because I was very nervous when I was doing the Pandora opens because I'm a fan of Doctor Who so I didn't want to mess it up uh, and uh, and of course, getting to work with Alex Ginkin at the time. And, and another uh, person, um, Francis Barber as Madame Kavarian. Yeah. Eye patch lady. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, very, I'd love to work with her more. That, 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 that's what we're going to call her now. Eye patch lady is her, yeah. is her new name. Um, now, <laughs> with Doctor Who being this CGI masterpiece and and what you see on set is really what you see on screen. Have you ever actually watched the episodes back you were in to see how it was different when you were on set? 
Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> the special effects, I mean, especially pyrotechnics, in reality, they, they can be a bit of a, a fizz rather than a bang. Uh, uh, and their costs, it's everything else they do in post-production that makes it so special. I think well, a danger, though, is that they can rely too much on the CGI and all the technology and they can forget the story. Because the, the joke of Doctor Who in, it, in its uh, early days was the production values. It's because it was a, uh, a story, an event, a programme that was ahead of its time. So we didn't have the technology. And so therefore, the strength of Doctor Who, I think, was the, was the stories. And and um, with with I mean, CGI has come a long way, but what would would would, um, would it work now if we just turn back to the classic Who formula of having everything handmade? Yeah, it's up to the production teams, really. I think it. I think I think some things being handmade would work better than CGI. But then CGI comes into its own with other things. So you could have a mixture of the two, really. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> having things cast across the camera lens on pieces of string, that's that's that as a thing of the past now, I we must admit. But uh, but there we go. <laughs> and um, and and it's it's sort of interesting because when you hear about stories about what it's like on set now. All, all the same of them, they were running away from a tennis ball on a stick. Yes. And that, that, to me, when you watch it on screen, that's oh, amazing. But I don't, I don't think it would be harder for the actors because you have to imagine this monster. Well, you see, people have asked and have made this statement before, but we're actors. And a, a goodly part of our acting is our imagination. And especially when you have to work in, in green screen, for example, there's nothing there. You just have to imagine mm. what you're and you have to rely on the directors and, and whoever to let you know what your eye line is and what direction you should be and, and what the motivation is. But if you're being told there's a dragon about to blow some fire at you, you just have, I mean, not too much imagination is required, is it? <laughs> yeah. And so for people out there watching this who want to be actors, what advice would you give them? Uh, get as much experience in different areas and different fields as you can. Uh, don't be afraid to get outside your comfort zone. And above all, communicate. Mm. There's uh, sometimes people are too scared to ask. Uh, and I can tell you uh, from personal experience is just pluck up the courage. If you need help from someone, just go up to them and say, I need help. Can you help me? Nine times out of ten, uh, uh, most people I know will help someone as best they can. And if they genuinely can't help, they often know someone else who might. Yeah. So they would at least give a suggestion who you should contact. Uh, um, with performance, with acting in particular, it's do, do, do. Find any reason to practice your craft. It's all well and good uh, reading the theory, but uh, find all sorts of ways to, to either do monologues or uh, to get together with friends and put on little scenes. Uh, it's just do, do, do. And that really sort of leans towards my answer on a previous question of yours uh, partly the reason i get involved with all sorts of projects is to just practice my craft and with not only do you uh, be in doctor who and on doctor who in the sense of big edition tv you're also a part of uh, the convention circuit what is from from every convention you've ever done if you can remember all of them what is your favourite moment from a convention? Well, I mean, the first convention I ever did, I turned up, and of course, we weren't given a handbook. There's no handbook. And everybody talked to me as if I'd been, as if I'd been doing it for 20 years previously. Uh, but I had no idea, because I didn't go to conventions. I knew about conventions, but I didn't go... Um, uh, but I was very lucky that the very first convention I did, 
the wonderful actor Kenneth Cope was sitting next to me, whose daughter Martha Cope uh, appears in uh, with, I think it's uh, Christopher Ecclestein's uh, last episodes. Uh, and, uh, um, and so I just turned to him and said, look, I have to admit, this is my first event. What do I actually do? <laughs> and he said, you just be yourself. They'll ask you questions and you answer them as best you can uh, and just be yourself. And that was very good. I'm eternally grateful to him for that bit of advice. Most conventions, oh, what's the things outstanding? There are so many things. I mean, seeing a space where there are hundreds of Daleks all speaking at the same time, that's really something quite bizarre. Seeing the wonderful costumes that uh, the fans put together. I mean, it's very clear that some of these fans put a lot of time and imagination into their costumes and clearly spend a lot of money too. Um, it's also seeing the camaraderie with the friends. Um, uh, um, I remember one time there were about 10 or 12 David Tennants. Wow. And they were in a in a circle chatting to each other <laughs> but they were being extremely friendly you know oh where did you get your jacket where did you get your sonic screwdriver uh -huh, those glasses where did you get them and they were you know being helpful with each other as yeah. well and the other thing that uh, has come to the fore there are, at these conventions is just not it's not just the actors and performers signing photographs there are all sorts of things going on and there are all sorts of stands selling all sorts of wares but also uh, uh, at the well-organized uh, events there's a stand where people can go if their costume has been torn and, it, and get it repaired free of charge wow uh, and that that is very very special on a personal basis I'm absolutely aware I wouldn't be talking to you now if it wasn't the fans. So I do like to sort of meet them and talk to talk to the fans. Um, I love meeting some of my heroes and getting to know them. I still pinch myself, for example, that um, I'm good friends with so many of them. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, is it a dream come true? I'm not sure if it's a dream come true. It's just... I'm so grateful that they've accepted me on the circuit yeah. and uh, and it's a wonderful time and also in the green room some of the banter is hysterical and some of the stories some of them have uh, Colin Spall is a great storyteller and uh, and of course he talks about all the actors he's worked with yeah. and and I just love it well, um, I, I, earlier this year, I interviewed Sophie Aldred, and she was telling me how she, how she signed a sandwich, and then they auctioned it off, but then someone ate the sandwich that had the ink on it. it do you have any experience that's uh, as weird as, as that? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I've got to be careful of the wording I use, because it can be, some people might be offended, but in America in particular, uh, you can be asked to sign all sorts of things. There was a guy who had all sorts of signatures over his body. He then had those signatures tattooed. Uh, and there's um, also there's some trepidation as well. Uh, sometimes people come and they got a, a huge poster with all sorts of Doctor Who character characters and actors on them, and it's been signed by. Uh, hundreds of um, actors, most of whom have died. You know? And then you're really scared that you're going to mess up the page. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, and uh, on one occasion, quite again, it's part of the learning curve. Uh, I used a silver Sharpie and it blobbed as I put as I put the as I put the pen, the Sharpie onto the onto the poster. It just blobbed a bubble. And I was mortified. I didn't know what to do, and I froze. But fortunately, the girl who had the poster, she was quite all right about it. She got a tissue, and she rolled it very thin to a point, and then she just placed it by the side of the bubble, 
and the bubble got absorbed into the tissue. So in the end, it didn't look as disastrous. That's it. But so, but again, so now I'm aware that some self, uh, some Sharpie pens blob, and so I try and do something beforehand. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, there's wonderful things. Uh, uh, are you aware of the radio uh, comedy show called Just a Minute? Yes. Right, Just a Minute. And for those who don't know, it's a radio show where people are asked to talk for a minute without repetition, deviation, or hesitation. Uh, and in Dallas one year, uh, I was over there with Ian McNeese and a few others, and Colin Spool again, and Wendy Padbury, and we were asked to take part in a Just a Minute panel. Absolutely enjoyed ourselves, the most hysterical time. Wonderful. Yeah, ju Just a Minute is amazing. And it was an amazing TV show as well, because it did a TV version. Yes, yes. Uh, the TV versions rarely last, though. Uh, I suppose it's because it's more of a, a listing show. But uh, hey, so I enjoyed doing that. There was, um, there was a time, there was Daleks parading around on a certain route at this convention. And um, I came across a, a girl in uh, crying uh, and I asked her what the problem was. And, and she said, my Dalek's got a puncture. She said, <laughs> right? and, it me and it meant that she couldn't go on the parade, right? But that gave me a light bulb moment. And when people asked me for my autobiography, uh, I named it. My Dalek has a puncture. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a, and then there's a second installment called My Dalek had another puncture. <laughs> and my, and then there is a trilogy and the trilogy is called Let Zygons Be Zygons. <laughs> oh, it's all good fun. Uh, and you know uh, does she know about the names? Does she know that you've named it? Oh that? no, she doesn't know. She doesn't know that she was the inspiration for it, which uh, um, I suppose I should have told her. But uh, I don't know. I wouldn't know where she is now. I well, can't even. But yeah. but that's but that's what happens. Things evolve. Um, especially in our industry, because it's very difficult. I mean, lots of actors talk about their career, and when you look back on what they've done, it might look as if there was a certain planned route, but in most cases, it, it's, uh, it's, it's things that evolve. So, for example, with me, um, every single job I did before Doctor Who, I had to audition for. Yeah. Absolutely everything. And whether it was for a project that would be sort of half day filming somewhere or if it was going to end up on a six month tour everything I had to audition for but once I did Doctor Who people just started asking for my availability wow. which which was wonderful so, uh, and because of Doctor Who I, I ended up in an episode uh, of a series called Getting On which was set in the NHS and they wanted a bariatric patient and for those who don't know what a bariatric patient is, somebody my size, uh, uh, you know, it's a large chap in a hospital bed. Uh, and Joe Brand was, uh, she won an Oscar, no, won an Oscar. <laughs> she won a BAFTA. She, she, won, a she won an Oscar. Yeah, uh, she won a BAFTA for the series. Uh, and um, there I, I was called in uh, by the casting director because he he was a Doctor Who fan, so when he found he had to find a large actor, he just chose me. Wow! I had to I had to go and meet uh, Sue Tully, the director, uh, but uh, they took me on, no problem at all. Um, but whatever I did in that getting on, then two other actors involved: uh, 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 Joe Scanlon and Vicky Pepperdine. They wrote another series called Puppy Love. And they wrote my character around my disability. So, uh, because I have mobility issues. And uh, so I played Joe Scanlon's husband, <laughs> who has agoraphobic, is agoraphobic. So he spent his time in there 
fixed caravan in a field. So wow. it was very good. And so that just all evolved. It just goes boing, boing, boing. Wow. Yeah. I'd never expected that. But when you look at Doctor Who actors, not just your big ones, they, they all end up going on to doing really big things. So Alex Kingston has got box sets of the River Song Diaries. She's been in the BBC version of Upstairs, Downstairs, and Karen Gillan's been in Jumanji, Marvel, whatever. And I reckon, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I reckon Doctor Who is a stepping stone to, to other bigger things. Well, if you're in yes. Doctor Who, you're more like everything else. I, I, uh, for my part, as I said, because of Doctor Who, I then went through a period of just being asked for my availability, which was, um, which is marvellous. When going back to conventions, because because I'm not, um, I don't go to many conventions, um, just because I, I I don't really go outside much, um, I, I don't live in a caravan. Um, have you ever been to uh, Gallifrey One? Yes, Gallifrey One was my very first American convention, mm. uh, way back in two thousand and twelve. Wow! And I think I've been to it twice now. Yes, and, and and that was very very special, uh, and but and of course it was my first experience of dealing with jet lag, mm. which is very very weird. I mean, some people don't suffer from it, but those who do will understand that uh, for a period until you've adjusted, you are in a, like a sort of dream world existence. Mm. Uh, and uh, Gallifrey One, it's it's uh, twenty four seven for three or four days. Yeah, I've seen it online because um, I I don't know her name, but there's there was a young child. She, she must have been about seven or eight. Must have been, and she was. She seemed to be the biggest Doctor Who fan ever because she was the youngest reporter, uh, as they called herself, and yeah. she went around and interviewed all the yes. Doctor Who stars. And 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 Gallifrey One looks like a a warm place. And yes. so much fun is it as fun as, as it would look like online? Uh, yes, and more. It, it it's great. I mean, <laughs> I also learned to because the uh, the Americans are much more in your face, but I mean that in a nice way. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's always using the word awesome. Oh my god, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, and I, I remember there was one event I was at, and I was walking from the lift to the breakfast room, and there were some fans in the lobby, right? Yeah. And all I said was morning. I went, morning, like that. And they all, in unison, went, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> which, was, which, was, which was very, it was very, very funny. But uh, I, do, I, I do love uh, the American fans. Uh, and especially those who've travelled, yeah, uh, because uh, uh, they want to know more. They're very enthusiastic. The other thing about fans worldwide is that they they because you know, in the main they're a bit geeky, mm. bit geeky and nerdy, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. They already know everything about you, but they then find a dig deep, 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 and find things about you. That even I was in in two or three occasions. I I was t totally flabbergasted because even I didn't know something about myself. But there you go. <laughs> but they have also helped me find things because yeah. um, the number of projects I've done that when they're broadcast in a different country, they're called something else. Yes, that that is that is a common occurrence. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah. So, uh, so it's um, it's it's great. Uh, the other thing in America is everybody's trying to sell you a new concept of something. And I and I remember, I remember the first time I went to Gallifrey, I was queuing to sort of register at the hotel, and the guy behind me was trying to explain to me <clears throat> that he painted some sort of bath tap. <laughs> and I and I couldn't work out why he was telling me this. Then I found out later it's because they're hoping you will invest. Wow. With 
with Doctor Who being this massive thing, and with Gallifrey One being so many fans. Yes. And and I don't know if this has ever happened, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use it in a hypothetical context. If you got lost at Gallifrey One, would it, are the fans so nice they'll be able to help you find where you where you where you want to be? Absolutely. Hmm. They all help each other. I uh, and uh, I've never experienced any situation where there's a, a thing of aggression with the fans. I've never noticed it. They're extremely patient because sometimes the queues are very, very long. But they're out to have a good time, and that's that's the main thing. They the, their costumes are extraordinary. Uh, and some try and do everything and get completely exhausted. I remember one, uh, I remember the first year, um, they asked me if I would be a judge for the masquerade ball, yeah. to which I said, but I got so tired, I had two hours between what I had just done to the masquerade ball. So I went to my room and I just lay on the bed because I'm just so tired. The next thing I know, it was seven o'clock in the morning. So I had missed the masquerade ball and I was absolutely devastated and felt shame. But when I eventually went down to breakfast, it turned out most people had fallen asleep as well. So I wasn't there. Uh, they're very understanding, most fans. Yeah. They just want to have a chat. They just want to take a selfie. Uh, and uh, and uh, some of them is extraordinary the idea of people buying something with my signature on that was a very strange thing for me at first mm. but it's amazing you know some just come along and buy one yeah. but then others come along and they'll buy five six seven eight wow. you know and I think they're spending that sort of money on me and so that's another reason why I I feel I was going to say obliged, but that's the wrong term. But it's only right yeah. that I give them time. Yeah. If they're going out of their way to come to these conventions uh, to see me and other people, it is only right that we give them the time that they deserve, is my opinion. Yeah. And, and it's not a chore, but it is extremely tiring. I can tell you, after a three-day convention, I feel as knackered as I do after doing a panto for six weeks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and at these conventions, because you've been to so many, has anyone ever come up to you dressed as Dorian? Yes. Now, the, one of the little ironies of life, contractually, I'm not allowed to go out as Dorian. Mm. But I have many photographs of people dressed up as Dorian standing next to me. <laughs> so you get away with it. Yeah, but uh, yes, I do, and it's 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 fantastic. Mm, yeah. yeah, and and that's what I like about legal loopholes. You just get yeah. people to do it, then it's not your fault. Mm. The BBC can't get at you if it's someone else is doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's you. Um, so coming now towards the end of this glorious, magical interview with the few what do you want for the future of either yourself or Dorian within the world within the world what what's what's the, what what do you want well for the future I mean I'm very lucky now uh, work is beginning to come back in again so I'm um, I've got I'm starting a project soon uh, a, a pilot for a new comedy series called um, Henry's House so that's exciting to do for the future I just love, would like to work uh, work and uh, because uh, I mean there are certain aspects of what I do that is work yeah. you know, can't be done. learning lines is working right but the rest of it once you learn the lines you're doing the job it's I don't want to be too blase about it but it is huge fun yeah. And the challenge of getting something done on time is huge fun. Uh, and that I just hope that there are opportunities, not just for me, but all performers. Um, as for Doctor Who, I can see, unless there's a major catastrophe, that uh, Doctor Who will just keep going. 
Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary next year. So I wouldn't be surprised if it goes, you know, I mean, alas, I won't be around, but I would love to be around for the hundredth of the said, you know, 100 year celebration of Doctor yeah. Who. I think um, as, as long as the writing keeps up, as long as the stories keep up, uh, as long as there are enough interesting actors to play the part of the Doctor uh, and uh, other supporting cast, I can't see why it needs to stop. That's that's my personal opinion. As for other things, I think uh, I would like to see uh, some production companies uh, and some other people who've got the money uh, to invest in the future and invest in new talent. Yeah. There's uh, you know there's lots of stuff written by the same people, for example, um, uh, or uh, you know uh, something is successful, and so for a long time people will try and copy it, which, I'm, in my opinion, is a mistake. Yeah. Uh, but there, I I know there is so much talent out there, from writers to production teams, and we mustn't forget uh, the behind the scenes teams. I mean, some of the people that are sort of forgotten in my mind uh, are stunt men and women. Yeah, they do. They do so much on the health and safety front. But you've got the the sound crew, the lighting crew, costumes, everybody, you know, um, uh, and the industry employs so many people. And, and so um, we could help the economy of whatever nation they're based in. So that's my political statement. <laughs> and, and stunt people, um, I, I'll say this, and, and then we'll draw this to a close, because I know what I'm going to say might sound really stupid, but the stunt people, their risk assessment must be so long, they can, you'd be spending a year reading it. A bit, a bit, oh. Yes, they, 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 the, the risk assessments are quite uh, vast, but uh, most of them are so experienced now that... Uh, most risk assessments will include the same thing. So they'll probably have a template yeah. and, and then just adjust a few of the, the clauses depending on the specific project that's in mind. And so coming towards the end of this interview, now for people that want to see more of you, not just yeah. on here, where can they find you? Don't give away your house address. But online, where can people you down? Well, there's uh, there's why my, my web page, uh, which is Fisher Becker, it's my surname without the hyphen, fisherbecker.com. Now that's a new web page because my original dot info um, was taken over by somebody else. So uh, so I've managed to get it down by not repaying the domain name for it. So, so, but I'm now, I'm fisherbecker.com. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm on YouTube. I have my own channel. Mm -hmm. And I do regular vlogs, which are welcome to subscribe to and share. Uh, um, uh, fantastic Books Publishing. Uh, the people who produced my books. All three of them. So there we go. Uh, uh, so you can go there. You can buy copies online uh, uh, from Amazon. And you, if you, uh, there's my Facebook page. Again, I've got a Facebook page that's been cloned, but my personal page has uh, the main banner is uh, of a ginger and white pussy cat, who we named SGC for Small Ginger Cat. And that's a picture. He died in 2018, and I haven't had the heart to take him down yet. But that, in oh, by the way, that's proof it is my page. And if you contact me via Facebook, and if you want signed copies, uh, you know, just contact me. We'll see what we can arrange. Um, well, where else? What else do you want to know? There's my IMDb page. Cool. Do have a look because there it's got my show reel. And it's, it's got clips from Puppy Love and from Doctors. I did an episode of Doctors in 2019. So if you go to my RMT page, you'll find what else I've been up to. Um, uh, and that's it. Yeah, I, I, I remember just, just before we come to an end, I, I want to tell you the story. I had an incident once where 
I was at my grandparents and we were going to leave to go out somewhere, me and my brother and my grandma. And, and I saw on the TV the Doctor Who was on. So I went, oh, oh, I wonder which Doctor it's going to be. So I sat in front of the TV. The title sequence came on. And it was Doctors. Oh, right. So I imagined the word Who. Yes. And and got really excited for a second. Yeah. And realised it was Doctors. Uh, for those who don't know, Doctors is a lunchtime soap in the UK. Uh, I, I think it's actually been repeated more in the evening now. Yeah, I've seen it more recently. There've been whatever's been on at lunchtime is repeated again uh, at seven o'clock, I think, uh, on uh, on one channel. It must be the BBC. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, what else? I, I think that's it, really. Um, yes. Uh, do feel free to contact me. Do feel free to ask, uh, but. It's subject to availability, and the nature of our industry is I could say to you, oh, yes, we can we can meet next Wednesday, but tomorrow I could get a phone call and find that I'm away for a week. You know, that's just the way it is. And is there any TV shows that you're in that are going to come out, uh, are going to transmit on TV soon that people can watch and see you in? Um, uh, the, un the timing of the transmission is very difficult now, but there we go. But as I say, I'm starting uh, uh, the pilot, filming the pilot for a new series called Henry's House, uh, which hopefully will be available next year. Yeah. So look forward to that. And the uh, 11th Doctor era of Doctor Who is available on BBC iPlayer. Uh, and if you're in Australia, it's on um, BritBox. I know that for a fact. And um, all the big finish stuff is on the big finish website. Um, and also, talking to Australia, I'm a co host of a radio podcast. Uh, it's called the No Name Trivia Show. Uh, and in Australia, it, well, I suppose it depends what time it is across Australia so fast, but um, it's based in Canberra and it's at 8 pm in Canberra on a Monday evening. It's 11 o'clock in the morning at the moment until the clocks change in the UK and it's broadcast nationwide via Facebook. The No Name Trivia Show and uh, the main host is uh, uh, Joseph McGrail Beta. I'm a co-host and there's another chap called Paul Boltwood. He's another co-host uh, co and we sort of take it in turns. I also get involved with uh, The Legend of the Travelling Tardis based in Florida. Florida, uh, and uh, just look those that's on YouTube. There you go. So, thank you guys for watching slash listening. Oh, I just remembered one other thing. <laughs> Sorry, I've been a right pain, aren't I? Let's see if I can find it. I probably can't find what I'm looking for now. Uh, oh, I had so many of these. Oh, they're gone now. That's a shame. Uh, I, I'm a regular contributor. Here we go. That's right. Back to the Hawk Chronicles. It's a radio broadcast. It's a radio uh, adventure, really. It's a spoof between a detective series and MI6. And I play a character called Tony Simon, who is an MI6 agent. I got uh, involved because I was asked as a, a guest artist for episode 103. Yeah. And I've now been since then every episode and this morning i've just recorded episode 189 wow where, so where, there we go the yeah. hawk chronicles where very good hear it? Where, where's it? there we go i think that's it for now see yeah. there's that's a, that's a lesson of me for me i should have planned this evening <laughs> this interview a bit better where is where is that available to people to listen to the hawk chronicles is online it's um uh it's um Spreaker, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, you know, uh, and Apple Podcasts, that it's online. So if you put in, uh, I think, uh, hawkchronicles.com. Yes, hawkchronicles.com, you can go to the site. There, there you go. Now we know... Now we know more information about Simon. We we can now rest easy knowing yeah. in in the notes. 
and hopefully Russell T Davis, if he's watching, uh, which I'm, I'd be really surprised if he is, uh, gets in touch with him to be in the circus here. That'll make us all very happy. Um, just saying, Russell, um, don't miss the opportunity. And so this podcast will be back shortly, soon, probably, hopefully. Depend on, depending on what day it is, depending on how I feel about it. Who knows what will happen? I do too much. Um, so, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you, Simon, for coming on and letting me interview you and witter on. Um, oh, it's, it was good fun. Yeah, it was very much fun. And thank you guys for watching and listening. Sorry to Spotify users. There is no video version of this because I'm on SoundCloud and they don't allow you to upload videos yet fix that and sorry to apple still they've still not fixed my microphone but and i've just hit a tardis it's start lighting up i don't know why um i'm being attacked by tardises now what a weird way to end this but thank you guys for watching and i'll i'll be back to yes i'll be back tomorrow on what's brit box to talk about the august lineup hopefully it's new who who knows thank you guys for watching time on time out Bye. Bye.